Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining. We'll just give it a couple of seconds for some people to, to join in, and then we'll get started. Looking. It always works. All right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Tracy, Event Marketing Manager with Henry Shine, and I'll be your moderator for today's event, Know Before You Build, Practice Design Budgeting and Floor Plan Zoning, hosted by Henry Shine Dental and sponsored by Midmark. If at any point during the webinar you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll be sure to cover them throughout the webinar or at the end. To ensure a smooth viewing experience, please make sure that your volume is up and any large applications on your computer or your mobile device are closed. No CE credits are being offered for viewing this particular presentation. Our speakers today are Dr. Jeff Carter and Pat Carter. Dr. Jeff Carter graduated from the University of Colorado School of Dentistry and practiced for 17 years. As a practicing dentist, Dr. Carter personally experienced the stress of working in poorly designed dental facilities. He transitioned to full-time dental office design over 20 years ago and is driven by the same desire today to help other dentists realize the benefits of a well-designed facility. Pat Carter graduated from the University of Tennessee with a degree in interior architecture. She was formerly vice president of THE Design Inc., a dental specialty design company. For more than 40 years, Pat has focused exclusively on the unique design challenges of the practicing dentist. In 2002, Dr. Jeff and Pat Carter founded the Practice Design Group as a collaborative and innovative design resource for dentists. So thanks to both of you for being with us today. And with that said, I will turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Tracy. Very well. Yeah. Good intro. Well done. Well, well done. done. Um, you, absolutely. <laughs> we're, we're delighted to be here. And as Tracy mentioned, if you've got questions during the process, we may have moments where we can stop and answer those. Otherwise, we definitely are committed to answering questions by the end of it. Uh, what we wanted to do certainly is to thank Midmark, to thank Henry Schein for making this possible. Uh, the webinar process is always an interesting one. We don't get a chance to speak to you directly other than live like this. So we always appreciate the opportunity to share information that we hope you find beneficial and helpful to projects that you're endeavoring to do. So to an idea of what we're going to cover over this next hour, we have three primary objectives. And of course, there'll be a body of information that we'll share in these uh, areas of uh, topics. One being budget and site parameters. What are the costs that you should anticipate? And then also what is, what are things that you should think about in selecting a site that would be beneficial? Second would be the floor plan itself, the layout of itself. What are the zoning principles that we teach often related to organizing your dental office so it's highly efficient? And then we'll have some other comments on the floor plan as well. And then thirdly, optimum room sizes. Lots of conversations around the appropriate size for especially the, or the operatory. So what would those sizes be that would be optimum in making the ergonomics and efficiency, the expectations that you've got for those effective? So one of the first things that you can do that is so helpful to your project is really defining what is your all-in budget. So everything you're gonna spend on the project. So you know every investment A to Z, soup to nuts, however you wanna say that. But we'll get more specific here in a second, but I don't know how many people over the years have sort of reached out to us and they've pursued a project for months, you know, sometimes even years with no real clear sort of expectations of what they want to invest in the project. So they have a vision, but they've never really synced up money with that. And so when I start throwing out numbers, you know, I always jokingly say that, you know, people are usually off by half, you know, and it's not the good half. So that, oh, I'm thinking about doing a new building. Well, if you, you know, talked about budget or had any budget considerations, well, I think it's X and invariably it's typically, you know, two X. So there's, you know, there's a couple ways here. Here's a little easy metric. We've been using this for a while. We've been working this metric for four or five years. 
And I would say with COVID, you know, we're struggling to stay in these numbers, but it, this is still realistic enough to get you at least started. So you got to at least sort of, you got to at least be in the ballpark of what's a realistic total project cost for whatever kind of project you're considering, just so you've got kind of a fighting chance once you get going into the design process or reaching out to lenders that you're, you know, you're, you're close enough that if it's a little bit higher, it's a little bit lower, you'll be okay. But so for example, let's say, you want to do a ground up construction building. So the easiest way to figure out total project costs, let's say, keep the math simple. So it's a group practice. There's three of you that you're going to do a 10 operatory office. So up front, if you want to just, you know, ballpark a number, how much it's going to be, you take the number of ops. I got 10 ops. It's a ground up construction building. That means I'm going to buy a piece of property. I'm going to build a, I'm going to improve a site. I'm going to build a shell. I'm going to do an interior finish out. I'm going to equip and furnish it. I'm going to pay people to help me to do all that stuff. Well, I take the number of operatories 10 times $200,000. So that means my 10 operatory office, probably in, in COVID times at a minimum is about a $2 million project. Okay, so I take 10 ops times $200,000. That gives me a projected cost of $2 million. So there's a chance that we say go plus or minus 20%. So you can say, okay, it could be anywhere from let's see, anywhere from 1.6 million to 2.4 million, you know, as a realistic range total project cost for 10 operators. If it's five operators, five times 200,000, that's a million dollar project, go plus or minus 20%. Uh, what's that is eight to eight eight hundred thousand to one point two million somewhere in there, but you at least got to be in a realistic range, especially the buildings. You know, if you get in a, in a highly built up urban areas and land is land is you know much more than ten dollars a square foot, well you're going to shoot right out of that range. And, you know, it's hard for dentists to compete with large commercial scale developers and people like that. It's hard to compete with Home Depot and Best Buy and people like that. So dental offices usually aren't in the most prime commercial space because it's so expensive. So just keep in mind, so our building that, that's that. So for an interior finish out, that means I go find a lease space, for example, that somebody else owns. I find a lease space and I'm gonna just finish out the inside of it. I'm not gonna build a shell. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put in my own parking, make side improvements. For a lease space, you take this uh, easy metric, you take the number of operators times 100,000. So let's say I'm going to go into uh, a new lease space area, commercial lease space, retail, and I'm going to I'm going to put in five ops. Hopefully, I'm going to put it in about 2,500 square feet. Or I take my five times 100,000 dollars. That's about a 500,000 dollar total project cost. So that's a tier finish out equipment and furnishings, you're gonna have some design fees, you're gonna have some MEP engineering fees, you're gonna have what else, Pat? You're gonna have- Furnishing. Furnishing. Artwork. Artwork. So there's hard construction costs and then there's other things on top of that, but this is total project cost. So 10 op interior finish out, you're probably looking at a million dollars. So it's 10 times $100,000. And some of the, the biggest swings in that number is how much equipment you have. So some people, let's say they're, they're getting rid of all their old equipment. They're sick of it. It's not ergonomic. They're ready to move on. You buy all, you know, you buy 10 ops of brand new equipment. Now that could shoot you out of that range. That's not a reason not to do it, but that can have a big impact on the overall cost. But just number of ops times 100,000 for an interior finish up, number of ops times 200,000 for ground up construction building. And then things like condos, condos are kind of like a lease space where you take the number of ops have five hundred thousand dollars, but then you have to add the cost of a condo. And condos can be when you add those two together, you're back to what you typically spend on a ground up construction building. So let's clarify for full construction building that that includes land, it includes the construction costs, it includes development of the site, obviously the furnishings, the artwork, the uh, equipment. When we say all in, we are saying all the dollars that you will choose to invest in a project beyond just the constructed cost. So and in buildings, especially people just aren't familiar with that process, but you have many, so you have structural engineering, you have a civil engineer, you have MEP so engineering, you have an cool. architect, you have interior design people, you have kind of dental design specialty people, whether that's somebody like us or a dealer, like right. a Henry Schein right. that has design people in house that can help you with that. Yes, there's a, there's a lot going on with buildings with that. You know, that's your greatest return at some point, but that's not a reason not to do it. It's just a reason up front to know that there's a, you know, there's significant costs attached to that. Yes. And the sooner you can catalog those, the better. 
So having said all that, so many of you may be, uh, you know, gee whiz, you know, <laughs> or you may have shut this off or you're just about to shut it off. Don't shut it off yet. Scaled, yeah, switch to something on TV. So Netflix, maybe you've switched <laughs> to Netflix. But so here's here's another metric. So we have a rule of thumb for everything you could ever think of in dental office design. But so up front, everybody, everyone that's ever done any kind of significant dental project was was concerned to a high degree financially, you know, logistically, what's the process? How do I how do I run a busy office and do this at the same time? I mean, in any other business, there would be people devoted 100 percent to developing a new project. As a dentist, you're working full time and then you're supposed to do this at night and the weekends and at lunch, you don't eat lunch, you work on your office. So there's always a concern, can I afford this? So we've tracked this for many years. I mean, Pat's been doing this for what, what was it, 40 years. Oh but we've tracked this for as long as Pat and I have been doing this, and it was actually as long as Pat has done it. And well-designed offices, that's why you're watching this. How do I well, how do I create a well-designed office that's going to get a good return, a good return on my investment? Well, if you do it well, it functions well, it get you get a little spiff or a little aesthetic appeal in there where you have a you have a competitive market advantage over the generic dental office down the street, you know, you attract more new patients, you're more productive because it's more efficient, but we've tracked this. So the typical office, let's say you're in a, you're an existing four ops, you jump out, it's, you bought it from a doctor who designed it 45 years ago, it's tired to say, you jump out and you do a new six op office mm -hmm. on your own. It's state of the art, you get in some new equipment, you got better ergonomics, it looks better, it's fresh. You know, have a nice grand opening. Well, on average, people in that scenario, they'll have a 35% increase in production at the end of two years. Okay, so what that means, like, let's say you're doing 100,000, but at the end of two years, you're going to be $135,000 a month. In the new scenario, at a minimum, typically, would say at an average, but really at a minimum, we've had people just have unbelievable, you know, increases. So what that means is, at the end of two years, you're up 35 percent. Well, we would say don't take on any project where at the end of two years your production has to increase more than 20 percent. So if I'm doing 100,000 and I have my new facility-related costs are 20,000 a month, that's a 20 that's a 20 percent increase in production to cover all that. That's safe. It's at the high end. We wish it was more like 10 or 8 percent of that, mm -hmm. but somewhere in that's a reasonable, a reasonable jump. If you're taking on a new office and let's say you calculate all the facility related costs to jump out of your existing office, go to the new one, and it's 50 percent, that, that's too much. You know, that's a scare. You know, you, you just you're not going to immediately go from, let's say, four to six ops and all of a sudden your production is going to increase fifty thousand dollars a month. Right. So there's some realistic ranges. But any new well-done office under the right circumstances will give you a, a big production increase and typically 35% or more at the end of a couple of years. Yeah. So you're, you're more than covering your debt service and you're putting money in your pocket. We don't want anyone to do a new project that doesn't put extra money in their pocket. Absolutely. Okay. And there's a lot of um, positive things that the lenders are offering packages that allow you well, to The lending up. is great. Now. Yeah. yeah, they're really... Yes. So they, and, and if you're wondering, yes, dentists are still building buildings. Dentists are still building out new lease spaces sometimes. It's just nice to know, are people still doing this? They, they definitely are. And they're all scared, but they're still doing yeah, it. They're, all, they're still doing it. And they it. should be. I mean, they should be, you know, cautiously That's right. optimistic. So let's, so we're going to go on to optimal site. Let's, yes. So so you do lease space. I'll do this on All right. Front. So we're, we've talked about our two scenarios, the two main scenarios. Obviously, there's remodels and stuff like that. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's say, okay, let's say you're in the category you want to do a new ground up building. So you've been in your own office. You've leased a five ops for 20 years. You're sick of paying a landlord and walking away from, you know, this building at the end and you have nothing to show for it. You've got equipment, you have the, the business entity of the practice but you don't have any real estate equity. So you're going to build your own ground up construction building. So let's say, how do you, how do you even do that? We get people call, hey, I want to do a new building. I don't even know where to start. What, I don't even know what step one is. Well, I assume I should look for land. Well, that's great. Yeah, you should look for land and kind of evaluate your practice. So first step, selecting property. How much property do I need? So we use, we use a metric. We keep going back to this. But let's say, once again, you're going to do a 10 op ground up construction building. Well, how, how big is that building? Well, we would say start with 10 ops times 500. So we, for every operatory, we want 500 square feet, not for the operatory, but just as a metric to calculate the overall project square footage. So 10 times 500, that's a, that's a 5,000 square foot building. Mm -hmm. 
So now actually I should use the example that's right up here. Bill. Why don't we? Why don't I take that? What is the number? So, six. Sorry, six. Sorry, so I should follow the graphic. Here. Okay, so let's get that. So let's say I want to do a six <laughs> construction building. Six times 500 square feet. That's a 3,000 square foot optimal building size to house my six operatory office and get all the typical support spaces that we would mm -hmm. think somebody should have, or you know, will support your production and all that kind of stuff. So 3,000 square foot building, how much land do I need to site a 3,000 square foot building? Well, I take that number times seven, I use a metric of seven, seven times 3,000, that's 21,000 square feet to give me the optimal amount of, of land or site square footage to place my 3,000 square foot six operatory building. An acre is 43,560. So we're right about half an acre. So when we say that, some people go, oh, that sounds like a lot, that doesn't sound like much. You've got to have adequate parking. A lot of that's kind of, you've got to have adequate parking. Nothing's worse, especially when you're kind of a built up area where there's nowhere to park. People are stressed, they're racing your office and there's nowhere to park. So that takes a lot of that into account. That, that, account, that accounts for setbacks, what they call water detention or water retention, setbacks, adequate parking and siding your building. But so then you could go out and say, hey, I need about half an acre. So you go out and you start looking around and then that's a whole nother thing. What's what's the proper location in terms of demographics, how it presents itself to the street, it's solar orientation. But at least you're at least you know what to look for. You're not, a, hey, I need land for a new building. Well, how big? I don't know. Just I just I need land. I, so so use that. Remember that metric. So Pat, you want to talk about the lease space? Why, of course. I'll be happy to use the example that's yes. on. Actually. So I will talk about the five operatories. Sorry. The 500 square feet that we use as a metric is based on an appropriately sized sterilization area, storage. We, we think about all the spaces. We're going to go into the floor plan here next. So when we use that matrix and you're wondering, gosh, do I really need that square footage? At, make the observation on the floor plan we're going to show you to see what we mean by using that as a matrix to give you an optimum scaled in size space. Uh, but making the assumption that you agree with this, five operatories five, times 500 square feet, we would be looking for a 2,500 square foot footprint. Now in lease space, there is a difference between rentable lease space and or net usable lease space. When a realtor talks to you about uh, 2,500 square feet, often they're talking in terms of rentable, which includes the exterior walls, perhaps a proportionate share of the lobby, et cetera. Square footage, if you will, that does not apply to your space. So when you're calculating or having that conversation with the realtor, you're actually requesting 2,500 of net or usable square footage, square footage within which I can design my office. So when you're renting, Sometimes a 2,500 square foot net space may translate to a 27 or 2,800 square foot rentable property or mm -hmm. site that you're accessing. So don't get those confused or at least be clear about what you want for your footprint. And then some of the other aspects of lease spaces that we think are significant because you do not control the site, the orientation or the parking. We often will then say, if you have several options that you're looking at, and oftentimes uh, we'll have clients send us property options that they've got, and we go through an evaluation process to say, which of these four locations might work the best for me? One, we show you here in this, these photos, uh, one would be north facing windows and or east facing windows for all operatories. So as we look at a potential layout, we wanna know that you've got glass or window exposure on the north and east side of a building. So that also tells you that if you are looking at a space with west windows, you want to avoid that. Or if you have options, you definitely want to go to the lease space that has those orientations because that light is friendly light to the operatories. And also check your power requirements or what's going to be available to that space. It's very typical that you will have a 200 amp panel available to any space in a tenant uh, opportunity. However, for a dental office, you're going to probably need 400 amps for the equipment, et cetera, easy, that you easy, will be yeah, easily. So we would also say that you want to make sure that you have the amperage that you need fed and within the lease uh, agreement that you secure uh, available to your space. And Pat, sorry. So and a part of the amperage, sometimes it doesn't even add up to 400 amps, but a lot of cities and municipalities make 
most dental equipment, any kind of major dental equipment has to be on its own dedicated circuit. Sure. So you might have something that draws one amp, but it's on its own dedicated 20 amp circuit. So just, you just get these huge panels of breakers everywhere, which so always a, throws people. So it's a, our point is it's a good thing to have on your list with the realtor that you're working with to say, I'm going to have these requirements of any lease space that we look at and or negotiate. Um, third would be a secondary private exit or some way of you accessing the space, your staff accessing the space that is different than the main entry. And this allows even for those doctors, especially all surgeons or pediatric, where you have compromised patients that want to have a secondary access exit there where they don't have to go back through the waiting area. So that's also something that you want to know is available or can be made available to your space. Number four, HVAC. Uh, the standard HVAC that would be out there would be generally what would we see in a lease space. One per 400 square feet, yeah. one ton for every 400 square feet. Which, and, which is not going to be what a dental office right. wants. And part of what we always talk about with dental offices, you have two, at least a minimum of two zones. That which is the operatory clinical zone where you have a lot of dynamic activity, a lot of energy being produced, if you will, that needs to be cool. Uh, perhaps demanding cool air at a higher level, obviously, than those that are sitting out in the waiting area, which may be a zone two in a two zoned um, facility. So what we're saying is for HVAC output, we need uh, 400, or excuse me, one ton for every 250, 250 right. square so feet, which is a very different calculation, if you will, or ratio. So again, that's a conversation and a point that you want to make with your realtor to say, I need to know that that's available to my space, so I'm not paying extra beyond the lease uh, to bring that into my space. Number five, um, if you can get pretty clear span, that's wonderful. New construction, yeah, no. for the most part, you will always typically see free clear space spans. But if you're going into, especially any kind of residential building, which we discourage, but if you go into any existing structure or older building, there may be columns. Columns. Mm -hmm. There may be um, wet stacks. Wet stacks. Yes, there may be high rise buildings. There, yeah, there you go. So there, and all of those take square footage. They're also things that we have to dance around, if you will, if you're laying out a space. So if you do, it's not to say you shouldn't pursue that as an option, but it's definitely going to be the type of space that you want to do a tenant finish out layout first to see what the compromises might be in having to dance or, if you will, compromise within the confines of columns, uh, load-bearing walls, that kind of thing that might be occurring. Six, the other thing is if you can get some height, I, I am one who believes that a, the ceiling is very important in the dental office. Yes, in the operatory, certainly because as patients, we're looking at it, but also just to lower the fear and increase the trust of a patient to have high ceilings, especially in these small little spaces that we organize as a dental facility, to have the height and the ceiling really helps the the space feel larger and less uh, scary, if I dare say it that way. So we like to see if we have an option of 12 feet, not always available, not always an option, but if you put that on the list to say, gee, I'd like to have some height in the spaces that are things that you're gonna offer me as options, then that's always a good thing. Seven would be the main entry that it should be identifiable. There's nothing worse than uh, telling them sweet 400 and then people are driving around the parking lot trying to figure out where suite 400 is. So if you can have a space such that when I pull up as a patient, it's obvious that's where I go in. That is where that suite is located. It's also what you will call a market presence um, of your space. So that's something we, we feel is significant. If you are an interior access space and every door up and down the hallway is solid, uh, and we always suggested to our doctors add a side light, add, a, add some glass into your entry, somehow identify your, your door in a different fashion from every other door so that people are drawn to it. When we see and walk by a, a glass entry, we have a tendency to look in or invite it in. Um, lastly, lastly is uh, any interior steps or elevation changes. Obviously within the space, um, we do not want to have elevation changes. There are IDA requirements for a dental facility where you are going to have wheelchair access from the front door to the back door, no matter what. And of course, any interior space that um, has elevation changes, it's going to impact your ability to utilize that space effectively 
uh, or even at all. So laundry list of items that when you're looking at a lease space, again, because these are spaces within which you're going to be confined. So you wanna make sure these things are taken into account, uh, especially when you're signing a lease and committing dollars per month, you wanna know that you've got everything you need available to that space uh, before signing that lease. Okay, I wanna go back to the building real fast. So, you do. So selecting properties, I'm realizing now that, so this actually is almost right at a half an acre. So see the building right here, this is six ops, there's, there's uh, four ops that way, two ops that way. But look at the parking here. So this is a, exactly one half an acre perfectly like you perfect use of the space but one thing we didn't say so parking you take the number of ops times 3.75 to give you adequate well, actually optimal parking it's going to be a lot more than the city requirements so city a lot of times for medical is one space for every 200 square feet that's 15 spaces in, in a, you'll never make it in six ops your staff will take half of it so we would say, so this is a six op building. There's 22 parking spaces here because we took six ops times 3.75, which I think is 22, somewhere around 22-ish, is ideal parking for that. So, so staff parks here, patients park here, patients going that way, that's the main entry. But that's how that's sited, and that's actually facing north, the uh, up sheet or up side part of the photo. So one of the things I would bet is those of you that do not have enough parking, you're going to be very sensitive to that. That's, yeah, that yeah, has so. to be part of the conversation when you're looking at site properties. Do I have the space to not well, only allow for my building, get some green area around the building, but also have enough parking? And if you're looking for a lease space, how many, you know, if I have right. six ops, I'm in a lease space and I've got three spaces out there or six and you, then they have to park in the street or, you know, so you also want to do the same thing for a lease space. I need yes. six ops, I need 22 -ish spaces. I need the number of ops times 3.75. If I can't get that, that's a real detriment to that, to that space. So um, another thing we're going to talk about as far as facility site plan is the shape of the space. So you can take 2,500 square feet and draw it out into a 20 foot wide, as you see there in the front on the top plan, uh, and a very long space. And you've achieved the comp accomplished, if you will, the square footage. But what you've created is a real problem, especially in the dental facility, where because of the depth of the operatory, and you can see that in this plan, because of the depth of the operatory plus the corridor, it leaves left in that width very little space. You can't create full spaces. So we call that kind of the shotgun type of space. Those are readily available, you see, in shopping centers where they have 20 foot bays, a very standard typical bay width, uh, which they offer for lease that might be 60 or 80 or even 100 feet deep and they achieve the square footage, but that you've now got a space that's not gonna conduct itself or allow for circulation in a way that will be optimum for dentistry. From there, you can move to, we see plans that are 30 to 38 well, lineal feet. In the narrow dimension, so the 30 narrow. to 35, you know, so that's the- Something like lesser. that. And, and as you can see in this floor plan, at least you've got the width to create where we see operatories on one side, a corridor, uh, which we would want to see at four foot to four foot six. And then you've got a body of spaces that are built beyond that. But you also notice that you're walking through spaces to get to a final space like that staff area. So again, that width is going to be limited and we call it stacking spaces. You, you start to see stacked spaces, which don't give you the circulation that you can see in the 40 foot width which is an optimum width that we see in the lower plan. And you can see the circulation, show them. You can see them Where? the circulation on the lower plan. Um, can I do the so, lower plan? Oh, do you wanna do yeah, the lower? Okay. Sure, go ahead. I was gonna do this section, but it's okay. Okay. Well, it's just, it's a, so, well, this is just a challenge as you get the stack room. So, so when you get to 40, the 40 is the minimum dimension. So this is 40-ish by eight. What would that be 60 ish but then you get internal you get internal circulation around a core see that core path so you yeah. can't do it here because you don't have at 30 to 35 you can't get another quarter through there but as soon as you hit 40 so i've mm -hmm. got 12 foot ops i've got a four foot six quarter and then i can have internal spaces that that meet you know or sandwich in here or insert here and work very this is so much better this could be great so so you get double loaded stuff everywhere everywhere i go i have a I have Access a space a off of that, space. yeah. That's so right. that gets very efficient. So in a ground up construction building, unless the site was some big, long, skinny site that totally dictated, you would never want to create a ground up construction building in the 30 to 35. And actually this gets inefficient. It looks, 
it looks like oh, you got a lot of stuff in there, but that gets really inefficient. This is very efficient. This is efficient square footage wise, but it just creates, it's not good flow. You can't get good zoning separation. It's hard to get privacy. I mean, look at this where, you know, you've got a 12 foot deep off, you got a four and a half foot quarter, and then you got a two foot strip. Yeah. So if this isn't a mass, it looks like a mess. So the facility dimensions can make or break an office. So, you know, you could, you pick a great space, adequate parking, good dimensions. I mean, all kinds of designs could work great in there. You pick a crummy lot with not enough parking and a weird proportion for the building and you're going to have trouble. The, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's not going to be able to bail you out of some really horrible dimensions to create, you know, create idealized flow. And he's not alive anymore. Not so he, help at all. He has he has offspring, doesn't he? He does have offspring. Okay. Yes, mentors. So yeah. so so you're going to talk about zoning. I am going to talk about zoning. So the next step, once you've selected the site, once you've set a budget, and all of those are beginning steps that should be very thoughtfully entered into. Now it's time to develop the floor plan. Sometimes the floor plan process is really comparing several spaces or even several lots. So we would call that schematic or test fitting before you sign the lease or before you've actually purchased the property, you've actually asked your architect or designer to show you, in fact, the footprint for my building and the parking that would be available on this site or another site. The same thing for a lease space. What lease space is really going to give me the best flow? And those test fits become very important. It's wonderful if you've got the opportunity to do that before you actually sign a lease. Sometimes we even coach our clients to sign a lease or sign a lease or a letter of intent to say, I intend to rent this space, but I want to have a period of due diligence where I can study the space to make sure it is going to perform for me. So it puts you at the top of the list or at the front of the line, if you will, to say, this space will be mine if I say yes. So when we look at the floor plan, one of the principles in studying design as a designer uh, is something called zoning. And zoning is a way of organizing spaces, it, whether it's a dental office, a hospital, bed, bath and beyond, state farm insurance aid, it doesn't matter. As a designer, how we are trained is to think in terms of organizing spaces in like function. And so for the dental office itself, there are three zones. There may be more zones or less zones depending upon the different type of project. But in a dental office, there are three zones. There are three zones identified as common function and common need. That means we wanna organize spaces in that common zone, if you will, together where they will work to create efficiency. So in the dental office, we identify them as the clinical zone where all the operative work is done, the public zone, which is where I, as a patient, when I come in and first start, if you will, occupying the space is the public zone. And last is the private zone where no patients necessarily are participating. But that's for your, yourself and your staff, spaces that support you. And how that shows up in a floor plan is how you organize the spaces. So we're gonna show you by this colored up plan. We, we often talk to, and we used to conduct workshops, well, we still conduct workshops, but we do workshops. We actually color your floor plan. So when you're given a floor plan, we suggest to our clients that you color it up to identify those zones. And what you want to see when you color your plan is a common core area in a common color. So we're gonna look at the clinical zone here. So you can see the clinical zone includes operative kinds of spaces. We have the operatories, Jeff's showing you on north and east wall, north, north, north exposure and east exposure, as we mentioned. East. We have lab, we have imaging. Okay. Yep, there's the lab that we have imaging. There we go. And the mechanical room. And then we have sterilization. And one thing that we find is important is a clinical toilet. Now in this plan, the clinical toilet is half blue and half red. That's indicating that the staff is going to be using that toilet as well. But here's the key about how you evaluate from a zoning standpoint. The question is always asked, do we have these spaces organized together such that as I go in and out of these spaces operating in the clinical zone, do I have easy access and they are otherwise not interrupted by other functions, call it public or private. So when we look at this floor plan, we would say, yes, this is zoned together. Then we move to the public zone. The public zone would be, and the clinical zone, by the way, is the first zone we would lay out. That's the priority. It's a dental office. We want to make sure we have spaces and optimum sized operatories and optimum orientation. The second zone is public. 
So the public zone, if you will, the, the patient that comes in and utilizes spaces, it would be the front desk waiting area, the business area, any patient amenities associated with that waiting area, the consultation space, and then the patient toilet. And that's significant when I say the patient toilet. The location of that patient toilet is a part of the public zone before I go into treatment. There's a lot of floor plans, for instance, where we see the only toilet that's available to me as a waiting patient is back in the clinical zone. That's a perfect example of what we would call a zoning violation. Why is it a violation and why do we care? Because I am a patient who's not in treatment, but I'm now gonna enter into the clinical zone and interrupt anything that's going in there, trying to obviously access the patient toilet. So in this plan, you can see all the yellow is together. As I go from space to space to space within this public zone, I am within that zone and I am not interrupted by either a private space or a clinical space. That's our first indication that this has been very efficiently and effectively designed. Then there is the private zone. The one thing we'll say about the private zone, if the clinical is laid out first and the public is laid out second, we want both of those to work optimally. And I'll mention a couple of things about how that is optimized. If we don't have the square footage, 500 square feet per op available to our, to our space, then this is where we might compromise. We are certainly not here to say, you don't need a staff lounge or you don't need a doctor's office, but these spaces may decrease in size because in our opinion, do you agree? This is a dental office. We want the dental spaces and the public space, if you will, to support the dental production and activity of this. The private zone is going to be the compromise zone. But you but can we see, still want it. We, but we still ideally, want it. We still want it. We don't, you know. We still we want, don't want to it. get rid of it. We don't want to get rid of it. But you can see the public zone is, or excuse me, the private zone is kind of sprung into the square footage that's available in left in this particular plan. And that's okay because the efficiency that we're really looking for is going to be a priority in the clinical and public zone, most certainly, and how those two zones relate. The private would be secondary access. So things like staff lounge, staff toilet, um, the support areas associated with staff, like a laundry room, lockers, that kind of thing, doctor's office, doctor's toilet, uh, general storage for the office, IT might be considered a private area, med gas, certainly a clinical support, and, and it's got to happen, but it may be located such that it is away from the clinical zone, and then the dental mechanical space itself. So again, you can see in this space- no, this is that building mechanical zone. That so is we, a building. So we put building. dental mechanical in a clinical zone. It could be in a, patients don't, don't go in there, but it's technically, it's part of clinical function. Fair enough, right. fair so, enough. so this building actually has a mechanical space there and a Within mechanical the space there, which are HVAC. You and know, the HVAC, dental mechanical is right there. Right there, there which is. is in the-, in the So again, the principles that we're talking about, going back to the floor plan to the next, slide there is the next image is really about examining a floor plan that is given to you and yeah and then showing that the clinical zone the public zone as it relates to it and then the private zone are organized in such a way that they're not interrupted so if you were to color up your floor plan and in the red zone you saw a yellow or you saw a blue in the example of coloring it up that's an indication to say is that going to create inefficiencies. And more than likely, when you start talking about the use of that space that has a function different than what's trying to happen all the way around it, the answer to that question would be yes, it's an inefficient thing. Uh, there are examples that we have in floor plans where there is a description made back to us from a client who's saying, well, I want my doctor's office right in the middle of the clinical zone because I want it to be real easy for me to get to it. That could be your unique way of organizing your spaces, but we would also say that you've taken prime real estate to put your doctor's office where there might be a clinical function that would be more optimally located in that space. A couple of things that I wanna say about the floor plan. Uh, when we look at the floor plan in organizing the space of any zone, the thing that you'll see in this is we have all the operatories right together and they are four, five across and then we have three down. We really don't wanna see operatories going much longer than, if you will, four or five operatories across. There are changes to that notion when you have 24, 25 ops that you're trying to create. 
But the thinking is you want to avoid that long clinical hallway corridor, if you will, and organizing the spaces in this way allows you to do that. Now notice as soon as we turn the corner, the relationship to the sterilization area, which always wants to be centrally located so that I don't have to walk any more than two or three operatories away. So the central sterilization area, which is located here, and I'm about two operatories away, but notice its orientation and its access. We have an opening here and we have an opening here. It mimics, if you will, the uh, opposite of the orientation or the shape and configuration of the operatories. And that's done very purposefully. So we will sometimes see floor plans where the sterilization area is way down here. And now that's great for these three ops, but for somebody carrying trays, that kind of thing from here, that's a long distance. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, so and then, so people, you know, when COVID showed up, people were going to People were concerned about, oh, do we, all those design principles still hold? So we were, I mean, we were not concerned, I guess, but we, you know, we were, it was very, I guess, heartening to realize, you know, all the stuff we've been promoting for many, many years, actually in, in times of COVID was great, you know, because we had spacing and social distancing. It was amazing how many things are, you know, had six feet separation between them. So I would say really the, the biggest challenge in COVID is if you have an office that didn't take an adequate amount of square footage to begin with, you'll get into a lot of those challenges. So going back to the number of operatories times 500 square feet to get an adequate amount of square footage, if you do that, you have a high probability of creating separation in times like this where there's a pandemic, which may come and go now at this point. I think it's this one's going away at some point, but something else may show up. So for example, in this plan, pull out some seating. There's six foot spacing here. There's this is actually six foot centers at the at these reception desks or the checkout areas. There's plenty of separation. Once you're back here, you're fully partitioned. These ops are 10 foot four wide. There's, there's no issues with separation on that. So really with good design compliance, it's an adjustment. It's not a major event where you've got to go back in and completely tear up and you know redo your office. So we thought all of that was good. So as we go into the clinical zone, Jeff, why don't you go into the specifics of the operatory okay. as far as sizing? So like I said, we were just mentioning, you've got to take, you take the number of operatories times 500 square feet to get the adequate amount of square footage. I think in, in, if you take anything out of this presentation, that's the most important thing you can do when you're looking for a new space. It's just, you've got to have an adequate amount of square footage. So like in the Northeast, when I always laugh at us and throw stuff at us when we you know, mention this, if you put you know, 10 ops in, in 2,800 square feet, you're going to have people on top of each other. You know, you're not going to have adequate separation. You're not going to, you're not going to have ops that are, you know, centered or there, there's enough separation between them. You're going to create issues. You're going to, in pandemic times, you're going to be taken out every other operatory. You'll be, you know, you're going to have issues trying to manage that kind of space. And also as you're planning, so for example, let's say there's three of you. Well, how many ops do we need? Well, so start with the square footage, 500 times the number of ops. We need at least two ops per doctor at a minimum. So if I'm a three doctor office, we okay, I need at least two for each doctor. I'm at six. You need some, you need one operator for every full-time hygienist. Three doctors could have two, three, four, five full-time hygienists. And then you need at least one flex or overflow mm -hmm. off. So it's just a formula, but back into what makes the most sense for you. So we see a lot of people trying to put two doctors and six ops. Well, if you each have two ops, you're at four, you got a flex or overflow off, you're at five, that leaves you one full-time hygienist. Well, two doctors are gonna more than exceed, you know, one full-time mm -hmm. hygienist typically, unless it's an unusual type of practice. But use that to at least arrive at the operatories because the operatory count drives everything else. It drives how much square footage you're looking for in land. It drives how large the lease space is. It drives the cost of your project, you know, so use all of those metrics to help you plan as you're moving forward. And then operatory size would just, gosh, we could spend hours on this, which I won't. Which we can't. We can't. But just in general terms, this is general practitioner. So whenever, anytime I go into this, I immediately get flooded with questions. What about pedo? What about oral surgery? What about endo? This, so general practice, if you said, hey, what's the ideal size operatory for a general practice facility? I would just, off the top, I would say, okay, it's 10 foot four wide, inside clear by about 12 feet deep. Okay, so how do we arrive at those dimensions? Well, this, and we could spend, like I said, we're not gonna go through all the background of why we would highly promote this type of operatory. 
but typically you've got 18 inches at the foot end of a chair. We would love to have a window at the foot end of every operatory. 18 inches of clearance. Uh, the, ch the dental chair is about six feet long with the headrest in, and you need anywhere from 24 to 30 inches between the headrest of the dental chair and a 12 o'clock cabinet in a typical GPOC configuration. That 12 o'clock cabinet is about 22 inches deep. You add all of that up, you're at about 11, six, and then typically we would promote some kind of wall, some type of stud wall behind that to feed utilities and create some privacy. But that gets you to about 12. And then going the other way, side cabinet, 18 inches deep. We need 32 inches between the dental chair and any fixed obstruction, which is our wheelchair clearance. That's actually also a comfortable reaching distance. If I'm seated here, if I'm the assistant, I can reach that cabinet, 32 inches. The chair's, the chair's 27 to 28 inches wide, another 32 inches, another 18 inches. I add all that up, I'm at about 10 foot four inside clear. So if it was a framing dimension, it might be 10, five, 10, five and a half. You can't do it in 10 feet. We used to do 10 feet for years. The, the chairs got bigger, people got bigger, the stools got bigger. People were getting wedged between in their stool between the side cabinet and the chair. So you got to get to about 10 foot four. And Pat, you want to say something about? Well, the ceiling height I mentioned already. So uh, the, the dental, if you're using a track light, then those mount at either eight foot or nine foot. Obviously, we would wanting the height of uh, the ceiling. Generally, we like to see those sitting at nine foot. Um, and that also means in, in this little example, we're showing it as a beam that would perhaps float below a higher ceiling. So that higher ceiling might be 11 foot, for instance. That gives the patient something more than just a um, physical tile with four million little holes in it to look at. And while that may not mean a whole lot to the dentist, it can mean a lot to the patient uh, because that's where we have our experience in the dental uh, treatment position. So um, if you can get the height, that, that gives you opportunities there. Ben, like I said, you know, you're, there's a lot of background about why we would recommend that type of operatory. But let's say operatory workflow, there's really only so many ways to get into and out of an operatory. So the worst ones are like seeing, like, well, I would say a single head entry. So imagine this a single head entry. You know, you're the assistant, you come in, the chair's up, you're right here, you seat the patient, the chair comes back down, the doctor comes in, that's the way he sits down, then the assistant is trapped if there's no opening there. They got to come all the way around here, come all the way back. Up. That's very inefficient. People say, well, my assistant never has to leave because we ever, you know, we never make a mistake. We never need to go get anything. Well, for those of you, okay, maybe that's fine in your case. Everybody else where you're up and down, running around, grabbing stuff. It just, that's very inefficient. Foot entry is a little bit better, but just the short answer to this whole thing on workflow, dual head entry is the standard now for general practice operatories. So if you go to Henry Shine and they lay out a plan for you, you're going to come back with a lot of dual head entry operatories where the patient's facing this way. There's a corridor here. Ideally, there's a window here. If you're a left or right-handed doctor, you zip right in. Left-handed or assistant, you zip right in. If you're lefty, you just the room flips. You rarely have dual foot entry because you have you know, uh, quarter traffic here, you're exposing people in the chair. That's not nearly as efficient. So that's by far your best way to get into and out of an operatory. There's all kinds of creative variations of that. See, this is head entry. These are all head entry. So you go, well, you know, I want a door on the operatory. Well, there's all kinds of ADA door clearance things that we could also talk about for hours. That these little boxes, there's only so many ways you can slap a door on operatories. Technically, you're not supposed to put a door on these dual head entry operatories because you don't meet the ADA clearance for push and pull sides of doors. One thing you do like at the end of a quarter, you can put a door across here. So I have my little clearance boxes. That's a fully ADA compliant door. I can open it, I can close it. Once I'm in here, it's private. But for the patients and the staff, once you're in, if this fills exactly like this up, it just has a, a door for extra privacy. You can also flip ops on their side and come at the foot in. So these are specialty ops. This is actually perio. They've got more, they've got more cabinetry up in here, but this is an ADA compliant door. Then this is a full blown oral surgery op. This is more like 14 wide by about six, uh, 16 or 17 feet deep, completely wrapped in cabinetry. They're actually oral surgery. They're standing up. They've got anesthesia and monitoring equipment down here. So if you look at this, you just take, typically you can't put doors on like that dual head entry. So one of the things I'll just say here, Jeff, um, because that's the kind of projects that we're seeing is general practitioners are bringing in oral surgeons or they're bringing in ortho or they're bringing in perio into their practices. Other, other practitioners that come in and use a facility perhaps two days a week or one day a month or that kind of thing. 
we're seeing a lot of facilities like that, which I think is a great concept because it allows you to provide service under your roof uh, to an area that may otherwise not have those specialists. So that quiet op, for instance, would be great for periodontists. So if you're thinking that would be a great idea for your area, then you want to start thinking about the operatory needs, the treatment needs that these specialists might have, and then make that facility such that you can allow for them to practice quite efficiently as well. So then let's just talk about the additional clinical spaces. So the operatory, the lab. So the lab actually gets the most central place of the operatories after the sterilization area. And it's really interesting when we do presentations, there's just not energy around the lab. You know, yeah. just how many, you know, just people know they need it, but they just don't, they don't put a lot of thought into it. But a typical, let's see, what are we at here? Seven operatory office, eight operatory office, lab, uh, somewhere around uh, nine to 10 by seven. You get an L-shaped countertop here. There's a model trimmer, sink, plaster trap lathe, uh, micro etcher, a lab handpiece, lab, or lab handpiece dust collector. Maybe your milling units in there, maybe it's not, maybe it's out in the hallway, but that would be a typical lab that would support that unless you have a production person in there. You know, there, it's, it's not that large a space. So here, this is literally that lab, you know, it's L-shaped. This has to be five feet. You have to have the wheelchair circular clearancing. Yeah. You have to have the, it's considered a, you know, accessible space. There's an example of a lab that's a little bit larger lab. What we don't want to see is where here's the lab, here's part of the lab, here's part of the lunch, there's a there's that's part of the lunchroom, here's storage. So you got people, you know, grinding on models and doing suck downs, and they're over here eating a sandwich that they just zapped in the microwave that has drips so, of plaster on it. Yeah, the idea of efficiency isn't about combining disparate functions. You want to have functions separated. That's how you're efficient. So that's just a, a little word of advice on that. And also the thing, Jeff, that's happening in labs, which is part of it, we're starting to see digital versus pour up. We're starting to see you know, 3D printers. All of those things are transitions that we're seeing in clients that, that we're working with. So uh, we, we stay real loose with what the lab might be. So that allows for future technologies to come in. So in an imaging, so the imaging area also Speaking wants to be of central of the operatories, central of the operatories. So for example, in this eight operatory plan. So here, you know, people come in, they check in, they wait here, they head back this way. And barely the first ops you come to are typically hygiene. So in this eight op office, hygiene, hygiene, hygiene. Well, we would typically group the imaging with that because people would have records taken on a hygiene recall. Occasionally you'll get a doctor that places a lot of implants and they want the imaging area over here by maybe their ops where they, they place implants and want to take tomographs and stuff. But when we say imaging, never, so we never anymore put the word x-ray anywhere in a plan because it just triggers a bunch of more stuff that at the city where, oh, x-ray. So we call it a nice sanitized, it's much <laughs> more pleasant set. Oh, I'm going to be imaged. I'm not going to be x-ray. I'm going to be imaged. Yes. But so this you know, here is a large format. It could be a 2D, 3D. It could be cone beam. There's actually a photo niche with a back of a thing called an image minor. We have to have a capture station. You should have an active. So where do you have to have an activator so you can see the capture screen and you can be at least six feet away from the imaging unit, the large format imaging unit, so you don't get zapped. So it's an interesting kind of dynamic how you set that up. But that would be a typical place for that. And pedo sometimes will do. So there's a actually a pan sept. This is a pedo ortho wing. Pan sept. And then here's a dedicated this wall mounted periapical for FMX. Here's a here's a cone beam with a lead that lead glass windows fifteen hundred dollars, which are you know so you can stand here look through it and if anybody moves stop stop the imaging. But we don't typically put that in for thirty five dollars. You could put a mirror over here, look at their reflection and see them <laughs> in there thing. versus the fifteen hundred dollar. <laughs> And that I seems like, like a good idea. And like Pat was saying, CAD cam, if you want to integrate CAD cam, and that's a gosh, probably half the people we work with now are on CAD cam, or gosh, some of them are even mentors or trainers. Or yeah. so yeah. here's a full production lab. I don't know, it's some that's some kind of fancy lab specific CAD cam. It's not, it's not CEREC. And sometimes people will display it out here, but just you know, we've done ones for doctors where we have a CAD CAM niche in addition to the lab. So mm -hmm. people, you know, patients can go in there, can see it. They have a 3D printers now are showing up everywhere. So like you said, we need, you know, we need room for all of that stuff. The mechanical room, it is in the clinical zone. Actually, the mid mark loves to call this the lungs of the office. You know, the, it is the lungs of the as office. we assign a body part to each face. <laughs> we get the lab we've got down to the liver or the pancreas. But, <laughs> 
the mechanical rooms is the lungs of the practice. And really our main concern, we want it to work well. I mean, Midmark makes some great, you know, dental, they make the best dental the mechanical best, units. Right. But our concern is designers is sound. You know, we just don't want to hear the thing rumbling and vibrating. We would love to have it by a back door. So here's kind of the private end of the, of the ADOP office. Great space of the dental mechanical, you know, the zip right in there, service it and run out. It, it's buffered. It's not, you know, it's not really near operatories. Um, what do we say? So to do that from a sound from a sound control, you got to weather strip the door. You've got to have an external makeup air supply. So if you weather strip this door and you have a ceiling fan that sucks the hot air out, and you don't have any makeup air, you create a vacuum. Yes, that doesn't you just, work. You kill the ceiling fan. Spray foam insulation, hard ceiling, no acoustical tile right. ceiling because that won't muffle the sound. Um, let's see, get that thing out of the way. So, so there's three. Four to five uh, feet for three ops, six to nine ops, six six by six. You know they can be bigger. I feel I just feel bad when I see somebody hooking one up where we've just pinched them in a little room. But you know you you don't want to take a ton of space. But you got you know look at a vacuum and compressor. Those are pretty good size units. They're pretty good size units. You know so they've got to fit in there. There you don't put the hot water heater in there. You don't put the electrical panels in there. But it just a uh, space something like that. So there's that move that around a hundred times. And now you're too. Okay. Yeah. So the sterilization area, which I showed you in that other plan, uh, where the orientation of it went up sheet to the north and east to the west, or excuse me, to the east, because those operatories were going north and east. This is an example of a U-shaped sterilization area, which is mimicking operatories that are all in one run on a north orientation orientation of operatories. So the thing that we would say about the sterilization area, ne I've never seen one that was too big. Usually it's too small. The sizing of the sterilization area really depends on the count of the operatory. So one of the things we caution you on is if you're designing your plan such, I'm gonna start with six off, but I'm eventually gonna to get to 14. That's my future growth plan. Then that sterilization area, it should be designed for the 14 ops that will eventually show up. Oftentimes, or typically why dental offices fail is they don't anticipate the growth of support areas, but we keep adding production areas called operatories. And then all of a sudden our sterilization areas, our storage areas, et cetera, no longer work for us, including the front desk. So that's one thing that we would say about the sterilization area. And it's always clean or dirty to clean. It's a flow, whether the shape is galley, as you see here in the upper photograph, whether it's an L shape, whether it is one galley or excuse me, one strip, it always will flow from dirty to clean, which is the objective for the sterilization area and always central to the operatories. And if at all possible, not any more than two or three operatories away uh, as far as access to that space. And as I said, it is a orientation, the shape of the sterilization is reflecting and or oriented towards the operatory configuration. So that's why you have these. Now, one of the things that's great about the Midmark system that they have is it's a metal infrastructure in those cabinets. And, and while that seems like a not big deal, and we certainly do a lot of mill work as in custom mill work in the office, such as the front desk, the staff area, that those spaces in the sterilization area that is such an abused area just from the use uh, activity of it in a, on a daily basis, that metal infrastructure is a huge benefit to dentists. And so we encourage you to take a look at those systems um, as far as satisfying the sterilization needs that you've got. So one of the things that I'm going to say just about the floor plan I, that I was starting okay. to say, and we're, we're in we closing. Have yeah, we have one minute. I was talking about sterilization area, but one thing I want to say about the number of ops, whatever the number of ops is, if it is something in this case where we have seven, we have three people at the front desk, that is determined to be the number of staff that we need to support that amount of production. And one of the things that I think really gets missed when designing the front area, there's a lot of time spent in designing the operatory and even the growth for the production in those operatories. As I use the example of five going to 10, that kind of scenario, then that front desk needs to support 10 operatories. So that front desk would go from two people, for instance, then to three people. And at the front desk, Jeff's already mentioned that those, each of those individuals have six feet of counter surface to be effective. 
And these are significant because we see over and over and over again in floor plans that the relationship between the front desk and the operatory clinical zone in its growth pattern or anticipated future growth um, are not considered. So we're gonna encourage you to have that as part of your conversation with floor plan. So questions, do we have some questions that we were? So we have, a, we have okay, let's see. So we have a minus 30 seconds left. A minus 30. Tracy, <laughs> any gut? Tracy, do you have anything I for see. us? Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, first question here, can you please elaborate on why we cannot have two doors for dual entry, assuming Dr. Side door is wide, complying with ADA specifications? Okay, good question, Trace. So you actually can't, well, it really messes up the object. So you have to have a three foot open door on the doctor's side. So on the, and it has to swing into the operatory because it can't swing out in the hallway because of fire egress unless you have a much larger hallway. So it swings in, but as it swings in, you have to have 18 inches on what they call the pole side of the door. So when I'm inside the operatory, when I come up to the door, I have to have an 18 inch clearance. So I'm at th 36 inches, 18 inches. I'm already at four and a half feet before I can have my 12 o'clock cabinet. My 12 o'clock cabinet is 44 inches wide. Let's see, 42 inches wide. So now I'm all the way. I'm all the way up to. I'm um, past eight feet. So that door on the other side, I'm less than two feet. I'm at two with my frame and stuff. I can hardly get a two foot door in there. So it shifts the 12 o'clock cabinet off of the center line. So we actually had drawings of this. You would have to have an operatory that's 13 feet, four inches wide to have two ADA compliant 3.0 doors on it. So you'd have to get to about 11, six-ish, 11. So you'd have to pump in another almost foot, let's say 14 inches to have a three foot door kick the 12 o'clock cabinet over and then even have a, a decent 2-0 door on the other side. So it just, it, it makes a mess of the operatory. And I've never seen a dentist that could stand and have the 12 o'clock cabinet off center. So, That's, yeah. So you're, you're, you, you, we've seen something you could pull the, the side cabinet off on the assistant side, which makes a mess of some other stuff. But you just, you can, it sounds like you should be able to do it and people have done it. But in the typical scenario, it doesn't work well at all. It, it, it introduces other ergonomics that are not useful at all. So, and I'm going to add that sometimes um, there are some um, areas where we have not even been allowed to do a handicap access door on the doctor side and a 2-0 door on the assistant side, that that was not allowed, that any door, any door that uh, a patient potentially could go through had to be handicap access. So it had to be a full... 30 foot door. So let me, let me show it on this. Maybe do you so, have? So, so go, let's go back to this track. So, right here, so this yeah. is about this opening right here is about 34 inches. So, if I'm going to have an ADA compliant 3 0 door, I'm already, I've already pushed that over. And like I said, I have to have another 18 inches on this side because the door has to come up here, swing back this way. So, I'm literally kicking that over almost 20 inches. So now all of a sudden the 12 o'clock cabinet is right there and how do I get my door in there? So, get, Well, and maintain that 10 foot four width. Well, That's why right, the operatory right. has to get bigger. And we're not here to pump air, um, more square footage into the operatory because the other thing that we're considering is when you're in the seated treatment they position, you wanna be able to reach the countertop. So while you pump the width to get those doors in, you've now made those counters too far, if you will, especially if you're assistant, to reach easily. So there are, there are so yeah, there's a configuration limit to what you can do just by getting those doors. So that's why we love this scenario where all you do is at the end of a quarter. So for example, this at the end of a quarter, this takes absolutely no more space, but in, invariably in an operatory run, you're going to hit the end somewhere. So this, uh, this works exactly the same as that, except you flip it, you come in at the foot. So I'm now taking this corridor and thrown it into the operatory. So instead of being 12 feet deep from here to here, I've grabbed another almost five feet. This is 17 feet. I, it's a ground up construction building. I put a window right there. These are great. These are great. We call them like surgery suites. Even though you're for larger procedure suites, you can have more equipment here. You can bring in mobile units. But those, yeah. once you're in the chair, they all work the same. But once you start kicking that stuff out, you start to destroy the function of that. So there's an ADA compliant door swinging into that. So some of you may be thinking, well, what about pocket doors? What about barn doors? Yeah. Pocket doors take out that utility, that wall that, right. that has utilities in it. And pocket doors, while it seems it would work, 
if you're going to frame it and still have utilities, you've now created a wall thickness of 10, well, some people 10 inches. To, so people have done a, a pocket door here. This side gets a pocket door. And that they, side gets a barn door. But they they've actually that. double fat in that wall. That wall has utilities. And there's another wall with a pocket door. And then the barn door sits on top of it. It's like a sandwich. It looks like an ice cream sandwich. <laughs> but there yeah, are but yeah, there are compliant ways that you can create. If, if your interest is to create visual uh, separation. A barn door is not going to give you sound separation. But you'll get, yeah, but which will, is one of your goals with which, a door is to right. get sound, right. Because a barn door is just like a flap and it's like <laughs> in a bathroom, you might as well just have the door off if it's a barn door. Well, I mean, it just has no <laughs> It's not flapping, but it is, oh, it's well, going to have exposure of sound. It just and hangs. It yeah, hangs. It hangs. It's, it's, but it will give you visual uh, separation. And so that that is a solution that we have used on projects. But um, I think it's worth discussing what the issues are and trying to get doors on everything. Uh, and maybe there are other ways you can accomplish some separation. Sometimes that's occurring because you've got an operatory, for instance, right across from the front desk. Or sometimes you haven't had enough separation from your clinical zone and your public zone to where you you feel forced to, to put doors on your operatories because you're right across from transactions that are trying to happen at a front desk. And that those are issues and why, again, we say 500 square feet per operatory should give you the space you need to create those separations where you are not forced, if you will, to throw doors on everything. Well, and there's just enough the misinformation out there where people have gotten away with it. Somebody will, yeah. oh, you know, we put a door on, they were fine. So some, some, you know, but technically that's not the intent of the ADA door swing, you know. So I think, Tracy, I think we've answered, I know. We answered the question. Okay. Is there anything else though that's pressing? Because I know we've gone over time a little bit here. Yeah, we have a couple of other questions. Um, with more offices getting printers and mills, shouldn't the digital lab be considered? Example, you know, having two labs and then they wrote dirty and digital. So I, <laughs> no. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah, yes. and we just said that. So actually, yes. this has it right here. So that's perfect. So this this doctor is a CERAC mentor. So there's a seven up. This is the CAD CAM niche. So the milling units are right here. The 3D printers right here. There's a workstation right here. There's storage for digital models. And then here's the wet, messy lab where you grind and make a mass and, you know, partake. So yeah, yeah that's exactly what this is. And that's a huge coming trend, you know. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You sure don't want to put, you know, $350,000 worth of digital milling stuff next to a, a plaster, you know, a model, model trimmer. And, well, yeah, no, that's, well, yeah. Well, you could, but that would be not a good idea. So and, that's and, an excellent question. We do see yeah. those transitions occurring in our offices now. Yeah, we would we yeah. would recommend it and really display it. I mean, that's a huge selling point to your office. If you're doing that, people are, they, you know, are fascinated by the milling process mm -hmm. and 3D printers and all that stuff. Show them the cart storage. So that's and, another thing. And that's cart storage. We mobile, call it cart. mobile cart storage. That's another thing. So you have the endocardio, the ortho Well, the acquisition units that go the to the milling units, units that you take here units. and you bring in and. And that's a whole strategy around this, Tracy, where if you look at these cabinets, these cabinets, there's no, there's there's a space for a mobile unit. It's just a sink cabinet. So an acquisition unit can come in here and be placed right there and not conflict with my attached to the chair doctor's module. So it doesn't, you know, it's 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 strategic. This office is just strategically designed for a doctor doing a lot of digital dentistry with mobile units, you know. CAD CAM and, and he does a lot of lab work too. But yeah, so, that's a great. So we had limited time, but those are the that's kinds of things question, we are yeah. definitely seeing in the clinical zone. You're, you said there was a one more question. Yes. Do we have to keep the water heater in the mechanical room? There's enough room and there's no other choice. What precaution should we take? Well, so that that comes up. So yeah. So we, and we've done, so for example, here's a dental mechanical room. So let's just say you, you've got to put the hot water heater in with it because there's no else to put it. That's typical in the lease space. So for example, if this were the, let's say it's a lease space. Okay, well, here would be, let's say the vacuum pump here. You know, let's say the vacuum pump is here, the compressor's here. Then you've got to stack like a shorty hot water heater above it. So you build, a, the contractor's got to build a beefy shelf out of, you know, two by sixes. But you can put a hot water heater, what do they call the low boy? Yeah. Well, so, so it starts about four feet and it goes up to six or seven feet, stacks above it. Or, which we also love, we have a tankless hot water heaters are, you know, some they work great. Uh, we have one in a, like a guest house. The little tiny box, it electrocutes the water, you know, has continued, you know, doesn't, it never runs out of hot water. So that's an option too. You know, you have to, 
you have to have the it takes a beefy you know amperage in the electrical panel i think it takes a i think it takes two dedicated 40 amp circuits for 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 example in this office two dedicated 40 amp circuits to have a tankless hot water heater that would would provide hot water to all of this but yes you can stack them above it's above the air compressor the vacuum pumps too tall but you can do it i mean it's it's not ideal like well in this one we actually have a this has a tankless hot water heater right there in a janitor's closet next to a mop sink so those are your two options stack it or go to a tankless I and mean, if you're if it's new construction you can control the electrical panel and all the wiring and they're not that ex a tankless is not that expensive they're three or four hundred bucks for something that would run this size office mm -hmm. anything good, else tracy that's a good question yeah. Yeah, these are great questions yeah, we have some other comments and some more um, comments or questions. <laughs> <laughs> we have some specific questions, so I can probably send them to you, then you can um, reply individually to them. Okay. Okay. We'd, We'd be, be happy, more than to. happy to do that. Thank you again to Dr. Carter and Pat for your presentation. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, you will receive a link to view the recording of today's presentation in the coming week via email. Um, so on behalf of Henry Schein and Midmark, thank you again for attending and everyone have a great night. Thanks, thank everybody. you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.